actually discussing some of these um, cases, seeing a lot of different ways that design fiction has been used uh, in both the industry, but also in some of the more recent, more uh, user-driven cases, which is more akin to what you could expect to do in a workshop like this. Now, just to sum up, we had this a way of talking about design fiction um, earlier on in the first video, that it is something that creates a story world, it is something that has a diegetic prototype being created inside that world, and we do it in order to actually create some kind of discourse, to create reflections and conversations about um, what is being made. And that is also going to be the, the basis for what we're doing here. That is that we're going to show some different things and sort of reflect on what is it they actually want to discuss with this specific design fiction. Um, so this what if is basically the turning point of the entire thing. So what if toys were more immersive, like this example from Fisher Price, the toy company, where they presented a design fiction of what they called the future of play, where what if you had ultra-fast uh, textile 3D printers? Or what if you had um, window panels in your house which could have augmented reality effects so they could function as screens so the entire living room could be an immersive play space for your kid? And, of course, a lot of touchscreen technology is embedded inside of these window panels. So you can actually use your entire home as a uh, learning space. Or below here, they have uh, IKEA who explored how... Again, also augmented reality has been the shit for the last couple of years um, in this domain. But what if you could mount in your kitchen lights projectors which could intelligently see and recognize objects in your kitchen and help you with cooking and help you actually make a more immersive way of uh, having the kitchen as sort of the the gathering space of the future. Um, Again, a good example of two non-technology companies using this method basically to explore from the possible to the plausible to the preferable what kind of future situations do they expect that they could be in what do they anticipate they have to prepare for now of course here you can see the discursive space is limited because it's really clear that they are making it the most preferred future vision that they can come up with they are not being quite critical here um, Fisher Price didn't ask the question: What happens with all the greasy fingers on that finger, uh, that um, window panel? <laughs> Wouldn't your entire window be completely unrecognizable after a short amount of time? And IKEA doesn't accommodate for. Well, what if you don't have IKEA um, kitchen equipment? Will it be able to recognize all kitchen equipments in the entire world? What will the machine learning benefits or uh, machine learning constraints for that be? Um, So there are a lot of things not being addressed here. And that's actually true for a lot of the sort of uh, corporate, corporate could we call it, uh, design fictions out there. Both from technology companies like Microsoft, Samsung, Google, but also from non-digital tech companies like the IKEA and the Fisher Pies, but also a Land Rover Jaguar fiction that I've made an analysis of in a paper, many of them don't really portray the full range of, of things that can be there. And you will actually see that for many of the design fictions that are created this day and age. Usually it's only the design agencies who dare to actually take this critical step and this way to actually provoke a little. With the other here, it is up to us as designers or as an audience to actually sort of pull it apart. So that's one of the first lessons here, that we really need to be careful that when we ask this what if, we should be very careful not to be normative, not to show how it should be done, how everything could just be nice, but also show, and that's a thing for your sketches throughout this week, also show where it could go wrong. Where could your concept actually have negative effects? And how would you, through your designerly skills, avoid that happening? What would you do? But it goes to show that I think we would need one more model for, um, for basically talking about how to frame this what-if speculation. 
and I think it's a model that you can use in your projects too. It's again one made by James Auger in the uh, paper we talked about in the, late, in the last video, one of the ones that I've uploaded for you for this workshop. It is a, um, it looks complicated, but it's actually rather simple. He has a horizontal axis of the past, the present, and the future, and it has sort of the uh, vertical dividing line of the present. Then he has the technology emergence, basically. And that is basically his way of saying from the moment that a new technology, and that is broad technology, it's not only digital, it can also be um, mechanical, it can be bioengineering, it can be service technologies, whatever. At the moment it is created, invented somewhere, it emerges basically. And all the dots down on the horizontal line before our present is basically Auguste's way of saying that most of the technology we are imagining the world with now are, even though they might be non-idiomatic, they have been implemented before, either in tech demos or in less successful products. We talked about the smartphone uh, in the last video that there had been many unsuccessful smartphones before the iPhone. But basically, that has formed, he calls it, that it has domesticated. It has made us used to some kind of way of looking at a piece of technology. Either as a gimmick or as a something that is taken for granted, a smartphone, whereas something like augmented reality, Internet of Things, are still being looked at a little at like some kind of a gimmicky thing. And then he has this dotted line he calls speculative futures. That is basically, in my interpretation at least, that is where we begin really to see that is pure speculation. That is where you are in the positive, uh, possible field. So it is possible, it is not science fiction, but it's really not hooked inside of any real uh, aspects of our here and now. Whereas the technology emergence starts on the right side of the present line. They are much more... Um, they are basically announced products. These things that tech companies have said next year will come out with a smartwatch which can do this and this and that. Or Google says next year our AI will be able to do this and this and that. So that is announced products which are just not yet there. And then he has this uh, dotted line on the left side below the past and goes into this alternative present or lost futures. And that is basically where uh, Auka says that and annotate them here, that we use our design fiction to actually frame how the present came to be. So, okay, why are we using smartphones the way we do? Okay, what, happened, what if the iPhone had never been launched? What if we had continued to cram um, phone features into the classic phone layout? How would that future look now by us having to control everything uh, through our phones, using our phones as the main device often in the day, etc., etc. But it could also be way, way, way back. What happened if a political decision, what happened if we had had regulations on the internet, if we did not have net neutrality, if that had been broken already back in the 90s, how would that have affected our information society? That can may seem a bit foreign. Why should we do that in design? We're designing something very specific. We are having a case partner. We're doing design with a purpose here. But sometimes these design fictions, which sort of elaborate and say the future is not set in stone, like the past, our decisions are the ones that create the future that we want to live in. So sometimes it can basically be what's needed to connect the dots here. And the important thing is that the line along the future where there is nothing right now, that is basically, at least in my interpretation of Auga, that is where our concepts lie. So that is where, when I ask you to make three to six video sketches in this workshop, it is basically that you begin to imagine, okay, how far along this future line should we go? And, and how should we basically... Divide us among them. Should we make all of our concepts as something that could be released a half year, a year from now? 
Or should we uh, also actually develop maybe some concepts that are a bit more far-fetched, but maybe address sort of a vision for where could this one idea, idea one to two, where could they actually end up in five years or ten years and show a scenario six that sort of shows the elaborated version of this vision here? How will that, what kind of what-if questions will that elaborate? And also, again, sometimes think that maybe one of the concepts that you do is actually one maybe that shows how we came here. How did this problem actually arise? And what critical decisions in the past or what critical user scenarios in the past has actually been the root cause for us standing in this problem that we're in today? This way of thinking about it, and if we can reflect upon it in this way, is basically the way we can sort of merge the building blocks together and come up with saying, okay, maybe not in this workshop, but maybe in your exam paper, you can begin to then reflect upon, okay, what would the most optimal preferred scenario then be based on me both having explored the possible, the plausible, the probable, maybe a preferable scenario, and also some contrafactual sort of design fiction which looks back at the lost futures and the alternative presence. Based on all of this, what kind of scenario do we actually present then and how do we qualify that this is, at the moment, the best idea that we have, the best scenario we can present and represent of our design? Hopefully it makes sense. Now, it is time to, as I promised, some some cases. And I don't think that we will watch all of the videos inside this video feed itself because then it will become very long. But I have included links for most of the videos and I will post more links on our Discord and our Moodle rooms too. So this is basically just to give you a gist of um, some more of the videos from the industry and then of course some of the user-driven ones. We start with a couple of those from the industry. You have already seen some of them. You've seen the IKEA and the Fisher Price one. And as I told you, a lot of people have used a augmented reality as the case of uh, design fiction. And it is, of course, a bit funny, uh, but it's also because that back when design fiction really boomed and became a, a hot topic in academia was around the same time when augmented reality was a booming new talk of the town technology within the tech business. That was especially because that Google created this concept called the Google Project Glass, the Google Glasses, basically, back in 2013. And they were the first who announced, basically, these uh, augmented reality mounted in everyday glassware. So you could basically walk around on the street with something resembling normal glasses and have digitally augmented information at your eyes at all times. And the funny thing about the Google Glasses were that when they announced the Google Glasses, they were still eight months from having a working functional developer prototype that they could actually show off to the press and actually give to the hands of a tech journalist or send out to early um, adopters or anything. They didn't have the product here, but they wanted to create the bus. They wanted to sort of begin to create a discourse for people to prepare, be prepared for this completely new use case. So they created what they essentially thought was just a commercial for the product they were about to launch. But what everyone else in the academia here basically said, okay, that is a design fiction um, for a product that is not yet here. And the interesting thing with the video you're going to see here is that none of what you see in the video is an actual Google Glass. It's all just made with a GoPro camera mounted on the head with some simple animation effects that we could do in 15 minutes in Adobe Premiere. And those of you who have ever tried a Google Glass will know that the real Google Glass headset couldn't do remotely something as nice as this video showed. But uh, let's see. See the video now. Um, meet me in front of Strand Books. 
at two. Oh man, really? Hey there, guy. Hey there, little guy. Sweet. Remind me to buy tickets for Monsieur Gano tonight. Where's the music section? Oh, yes, this is it. Is Paul here yet? Huh. Hey, dude, how's it going? You want to go check out that new place I was telling you about? Sure. This truck's really good. Hey, just a second. Cool. Good to see you again. Thanks, man. Just got a new place, not that city. See you, dude. Okay, so spoiler alerts, he's going to go to a rooftop and play the ukulele for his long-distance relationship girlfriend, so everything will be uh, all right in the end. You can see here he's running up and uh, stops the music and he has some video chat. Hi, what's up? Hey. Hey. You want to say something cool? Yeah, sure. Is that a ukulele? Yep. Okay, here goes. Oh, again, this is interesting because Google did not see this as a design fiction. They saw it as a commercial for a product they were about to launch. But again, when the Google Glass launched in a developer prototype, the first thing was that this display was only right up in the glancing eye of your 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 um, sort of your visual spectrum so you couldn't really see an all encompassing screen like this and many of the features didn't really work that well and the interface wasn't as polished at this at all and the interesting thing was already one day after this video aired eight months before they had actually launched a product and eight months of engineering time that's millions of dollars we're talking here one day after this video launched, people were already beginning to discuss this video. Not just tech journalists, but regular users were discussing online, on tech forums, on YouTube commentary feeds, that, okay, is this actually a desirable product for a end user to have in that kind of scenario? I, I mean, it looks great in the way that they portray it. Look, he maintains a long-distance relationship. That's cool. But... Mm, is that a camera which is mounted on the on the glasses? Would I be comfortable talking to my friend if I didn't know if I was actually being re video recorded by him? Is that desirable? Is that something that I would that I would like? And, and hey, what what is that about? How did he interact with it? He used his voice all the time. If I saw someone walking into a bookstore and then shouting rather loudly, "Where is the music section?" I think I would, as a bystander, think that that person needed another kind of help than finding the music section. Um, and those questions began to basically arise, and people began to really discuss this. And it didn't take more than uh, one day for people to say, okay, people would be such glass holes if they came around and just filmed me or used this product all the time. So it took one day, two days maybe, before this etiquette, this glass hole term, an asshole with Google glasses on them, was coined. And it completely took over the entire internet discourse about this product. People began to imagine the situations where this would not be beneficial, like at a meeting where you constantly sit and glance up at the screen up in your uh, upper right corner of your eye. And people began to also reflect upon, is there... Places where you would be kind of uncomfortable with persons wearing that kind of stuff. Um, that could be, um, let's say, something like this. Would that be comfortable? Mm, I think it would be more like a... 
I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. Um, now, of course, as everyone knows, this product bombed totally. Google uh, ended up not completing its uh, lead user early adopters program. But they did it one year later. Millions of dollars spent to create what should have been a consumer product before they figured out that the the culture wasn't really ready and the design problems of how to actually make this in an ethically correct way that won't stigmatize in public, etc., wasn't really developed. I was at conferences back then, back in 2014, when it, the product had actually launched in an early adopters program. And many conferences had signs saying, glass holes not allowed in the conference room. So it was really, people hated the product, hated the culture that it tried to enforce. But now, I think it was last year or two years ago, Google actually relaunched the Google Glass as an enterprise product, saying, okay, maybe it is not a consumer product. Maybe it's not something that people would be comfortable wearing in public. But truck drivers, surgeons, people in high-risk jobs might actually get some value from this. My question is, maybe they could have learned that by just making the video sketch, listen to the user reflections, and then make a couple of iterations to actually see that that local hill they were climbing might not have been the global maxima at that point for augmented reality glasses. Um, In the slide deck, we won't watch it now, but in the slide deck, I have also included from around the same time Nokia's own concept for augmented reality glasses. It's widely different. There are some similar ideas, but there are also clearly some ideas that show why Nokia actually ended up failing in the entire smart device race because you can clearly see they they hadn't understood either the user culture. What is actually want to use modern mobile technology for? Um, I'll encourage you to see it yourself. It is is quite hilarious how bad it is. It was actually recorded in Sudhaun. Um, But it doesn't have to be video. This uh, other example here from industry is a design agency uh, in the United States called the uh, Near Future Laboratory who work together with the convenience stores in the United States on trying to make a proposal for what kind of products should convenience stores prepare for in the next 10 years, so towards 2025, that actually might be something you had the option of buying into your assortment in a store. So that might be... uh, child following drones or drones who could walk your uh, your dog or it could be uh, bitcoin cryptocurrency mining services could that be something that you could buy as you could buy a um, burner phone sim cards could you then buy time on a bitcoin miner uh, server for an example just to provoke these non-technical stakeholders to actually begin to reflect upon what kind of future they should prepare for a really interesting case too um, and speaking of, draw, of drones before, this one is rather interesting too. Just to see a rather bit of it here. This is a proposal for, which was a real proposal in the United Kingdom, in the city of London, where they had proposed, what if we could surveillance the city through drones? And there had been a lot of discussion about, okay, but uh, we will feel violated and we will feel we are being watched by the government. And then the proposal was, what about if we just let citizens lock on and off to these drones all the time? So citizens can essentially surveillance each other, then there wouldn't be no problem because everyone has the same right. And this research project basically uh, called Game of Drones basically tried to just showcase some examples of how would that look? You could see the Xbox controller in the beginning here where they actually tried to say, okay, what if a user controlled this drone? And this is basically that they... The scenario ends with two uh, people uh, getting into a heated argument because they are actually beginning to try to get each other uh, parking tickets. So luckily, this actually led to that the city of London discontinued the legislation of using drones to surveillance uh, London. But it does show us that in the industry, this has been used both to speculate, to market, but also, as we saw with the IKEA and the Fisher Prize, to actually lay the foundation for some visions of the not-so-near uh, or not-so-far future again. 
and as we've seen with the Apple Knowledge Navigator, also for the bit longer run. But before we end here, I think we should take some uh, some cases from some smaller studios, some smaller setups uh, than those who actually have big marketing budgets and stuff like and big R and D budgets to create this kind of stuff. And the first one I'll take from a small design studio. Actually, it's the studio from before the uh, near future laboratory. A small, back then at least, small design studio with some PhDs in design who tried to reflect upon, they, this is from the convenience store project they did, where they tried to make some projections of this, the convenience store of 2025. How would that look? And again, this is made in 2012. So some of the digital services they imagine here don't even exist really anymore. But let's, um, let's see two user scenarios they tried to portray for us. So again, augmented reality, but what if with, they were so cheap that you could actually have magazines in them? And of course, a trucker wants the big booty bitches magazine. Now other people in the room where you're sitting and sitting there seeing this will suddenly begin to say, what are you, what are you actually watching? That guy is a highway accident waiting to happen with those classes. But again, you can see this is really, really simple, this sketch, right? It's, um, there is no special effects, really. Only some cutout effects where they try to show this. What if you could have Tic Tacs with pheromones? What if you uh, had panda jerky because pandas are not endangered animals anymore? Etc., etc. And then they begin to showcase. They more imply that the technologies are there. And thus they take them for granted. And that's the great thing about this, that it is so implicit. And yet still we have a lot of reflections about the products, who would buy them. You also have the first one where they sort of set the scene of this guy looking very much like a thug that might want to steal some things from the shop. And then we end out, okay, it's actually because there is a culture of self-checkout, which back in 2012 was rather new, a rather new thing. But you can see there, uh, nowadays you can actually buy an app, pay for the things, and then just leave the supermarket without ever going through a cashier ride here in Denmark too. So it does go to show that this speculation can be done in many ways. And this is a really, was really low-key way of doing it. Um, let's take another example. This is from a design student uh, a couple of years ago where they explored together with a company making different uh, kind of 
home uh, decor, like bathroom, like uh, mirrors and stuff like that. Um, in what if you could implement uh, intelligent uh, technologies inside and machine learning inside a mirror? And then they created this Miro concept, as they ended up uh, calling it. What do I have for workout clothes? That's perfect. perfect. What is Jen wearing to the gym? Jen is wearing that to the gym? Jen looks so cute. I have nothing that cute. I need to go shopping. My wardrobe is so outdated. And you can see again here, it's not really um, Hollywood uh, special effects or acting for that matter. Um, but it is a neat video. Again, because it, it doesn't really showcase any of the negative effects. Uh, I'm thinking, was there actually implied that there were a camera again in this mirror? And what would happen if this was in your ba bathroom or in your, um, in your yeah, whatever room where you might uh, walk around naked at some times or whatever? Um, and what about data privacy? What about uh, marketing? Who should have access to these different things? Could you imagine different things here it provokes a lot of questions at least about a round of this furniture and this sketch was done in less than half a day basically from ideation to having made this small video narrative so it shows the strengths of how design students can work around with this too and it can also be a lot more rough here um if you will indulge me i think we'll take two uh to three examples more and then we'll close it uh, in a couple of minutes uh, this video here but this one is uh, from a a design workshop in Gothenburg, um, where some students had the design challenge of figuring out what if the future of librarians were digital agents. And since they didn't have an advanced enough Siri or Google uh, Now uh, that could do all of the things they sort of wanted to ideate, they just chose one of the students to actually play the digital assistant in this really, really rapidly made scenario. Hi, welcome to the Gothenburg Library. How may I help you? I'm interested in this author, Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, yes. I, uh, I love Hunter S. Thompson. He's one of my personal favorites. I recommend you trying out... Um, start with ah, The Rum Diary. Oh really? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And maybe Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And then there's this documentary, yeah. Breakfast with Hunter. It's pretty good. Um, and then there's this Rolling Stone interview also that you might check out. Okay. Well, I want to see a little bit more about this Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Do you have a little preview of that for me maybe? Yeah. Great. So this movie uh, is based on... So the interesting thing here, most of this is actually improvised on the spot. They had prepared some features, so to speak, but then they just let the camera roll and try to enact these things. And he was instructed in, you have to respond on queries and complete your career queries like a AI would do. They had sort of a taxonomy of how that would be. 
And I think one of the things you should remark was that actually our user, when it presented the ROM diary, our user was actually quick to say, yeah, I actually want to see that. But the AI just continued and presented Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. It even, they had made that choice of saying, okay, what if the AI would present sort of personalized recommendations? Say, I, I actually like this one. This is pretty good. And the, it begs the question, is that based on real user sort of um, evaluations or is it actually an opinion they have built into the algorithm here? But the interesting thing here was about the query. You can actually see that the, it's a persuasive thing that the AI query actually nudged the user over into picking Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas instead of the drum, rum diary here. So it shows that with really few and really simple means of producing a story, you can actually explore very, very elaborate technological problems about a digital service as this one. And um, yeah, this is actually also one made for, by some Auburn University design, service design students. I know uh, interactive media students, actually, um, in which they try to create a a proposal for Unilever, those who make the Knorr uh, food, in how to make more customizable and more sustainable ways of delivering uh, food packages, especially for the younger target audience. And they basically created most of this video sketch by just uh, applying still images to explore this way of going in a journey into a supermarket and have a customized meal. Let's just uh, quickly look at it. You can see here, I've just killed the audio here. Still images all along the way. And then, of course, they designed an app. It was a couple of years ago. Um, and then they combine this with some text images. And then they, you can see here, they show some really, really simple animation effects. Really, really simple, but it, com it sort of communicates rather well. Okay, so you actually combine what kind of tastes you want and only want to get exactly that from this automate and then you actually are asked to buy the specific things that you need in order to actually complete this meal so you basically create your own meal packages in this way really really simple it begins to ask the question of okay hmm, you talk about that this could minimize waste is that less wasteful is it because can you be sure that you need an entire pepper and an entire this and this and that in this? Uh, can you actually make sure, does it actually solve the problem was uh, one of the questions. And there was another thing, of, you know, could you actually have made it even smarter so the ingredients would also have been in this machine? Could you actually reframe the entire way a supermarket would be? So we actually just got back with all the things when you have selected it. Um, and they iterated further on that too. And, um, oh, which one should we take as the last one here? Um, let's take... This is one uh, also, this is uh, some students working with a, uh, a nature festival called Naturmød, which is basically a way of getting to know your both the cities and the, the parks and city lives, uh, the, the nature lives around cities. Um, where these students uh, try to, again, an app, don't always make an app, please. Um, but it's a rather high fidelity in the looks, but it was actually made in less than a day. And so it also just shows how quick we can actually put something together inside of this uh, Adobe Premiere combination of softwares. If I could get it to start. Ah, I like that. So you can see they made sort of a Pokemon Go out of uh, capturing and finding uh, culturally interesting places inside of your city. I think it was that year where Pokemon Go was the shit, basically. So the digital service design itself is, my, is maybe not that good, but as you can see, the sketch is rather convincing in actually showing us what can be done. 
and also showing us what you actually have to need to do um, to go across these multiple cultural institutions here. And some of the questions that we came to rise was, okay, how will we actually ensure that users have this behavior? Will they actually want to find all the places or could we make um, imagine that the users had a bit more bottom-up control so they could create their own journeys or she could send a journey to her boyfriends uh, or her family because she knows their interests better so could it be more of a social sharing rather than social sharing in this news kind of way that they show in the end of the video. So again, something made in a couple of hours provoking some reframings which would have taken a physical prototype out of user testing in the wild to maybe get in another way, way around it. So, hopefully you can see that combined with this James Auger way of talking about where are we? Is it scenario one that is close to what we can do here now or is it a bit farther out in the sort of time frame, like a 2025 time frame or a 2030 time frame. And what kind of speculation do we actually do? And what kind of technique do we actually do here? That is the basis of it. That is basically what we need to do when we do design fiction. Um, so as sort of a, maybe some homework I would encourage you to watch one more video because right now we could say all good, okay, we can use design fiction, we can use this, uh, these models to sort of place the things, we can uh, sort of begin to figure out how speculative are we, etc., etc. It seems rather good. I will encourage you to watch this uh, video called The Selfish Ledger. It is a uh, leaked video that was leaked from Google last year. Um, in which uh, uh, Google basically has brainstormed about their way of leveraging all of that user data that they have collected on us throughout the years. And they actually showcase a concept where they can notch us into buying mass customized products without us really knowing it. And the thing that they do in this sketch is that they actually frame it as that it is for our own good. I encourage you, it's a rather long video. It is a eight and a half minutes long, so we won't see it in, it in its entirety. But as homework for tomorrow, I would encourage you really to watch this video because it does show that even though this is a good method, we have a responsibility because fiction is very persuasive. We can sit in the inner core as designers ourselves and begin to show only our design idea from the most preferable side. That's what you see in many of the design fiction I have shown you here today. And then when we begin to show it to companies, we also sort of begin to say, okay, we want them to like our ideas. We want to show them that preferable world. So we might actually hold ourselves back to showcase them a more sort of broader future spectrum, the more broader speculation, maybe just to provoke them. We know that this is not what they want but we just want to provoke them into having some discussions with us so we can learn more. So there's persuasion here also out in the company, out in the sort of the... And especially if we begin to show this to potential users, if we have not been careful in addressing head-on what the discourse of space is, remember again, we create a story world, we create something inside of it, but we do it in order to create discourse, to create discussions. If we're not careful in framing what kind of discussion we want, then we end up actually cheating people and sort of nudging people into liking our visions. So that's why I'm going to end here with a model from my book, um, sort of my storytelling model for what components do we have in a design fiction. We have this technology often, be it a digital technology, be it a service journey or whatever, a non-linear form of technology. And we throw it into a narrative where we have personas, we have scenarios, we have sub-scenarios. And an important thing here is that these subplots, this subplot that I mentioned here, needs, and you can see that in many, many design fictions, they don't do that. And that's where they go wrong. They don't reference sort of the ethical stance towards the user experience. And that is, they don't address head-on what are the questions? What is the discourse 
that I want to promote here? What questions do I ask? What questions do I answer? But also, what do I leave up to the audience, the viewer, to actually reflect upon? And that is the really, really important thing when you plan your own design fictions. Consider both the concept idea, the diegetic prototype, the technology. Consider the personas. Consider the plot. What is the overall sort of world, the story world you're going to create? But also, what kind of subplots are there in order to create reflection? One of the ones who does it really, really good is the hyper-reality from the previous video, the one with the unregulated augmented reality in the cityscape. It checks all the bars here. But can you also do that in your videos, both the ones where you showcase the product as the preferable solution and also the ones where you sort of open up the speculation playing field a bit more? I think it's one of the most important things, basically, because we take away the focus from technology itself when we tell a story about it. And when we do that, we basically allow the context and the conflict and the characters to become present and to become something we can immerse ourselves in. But it also needs to open up for interpretation. We need to allow for these interpretations and allow for discussions so it doesn't just become technology or service design fascination, all of it. So that sums up to sort of our our takeaways here. Oh, not the book. Our takeaways. That temporal, temporality, that of adding video, it adds a narrative dimension. Even if the story is not stated explicitly, there will be story as soon as we have video. We can use these videos to gather feedback. We saw the one with the Google Glasses. We can actually gather feedback much, much earlier than a physical prototype can do. And both the internal and external design fiction videos, both the ones used for um, small design workshops like this and the ones shared with the public, they can serve as vehicles for discussions about the feasibility and desirability of our design visions. And finally, but not least, we need to remember that storytelling includes this responsibility. It is very persuasive. So we need to be very explicit about the ethics. What question do we want to answer? What question do we want to ask? And what do we simply not know? What do we simply not know if it will be preferable or not? And as much as we can be transparent with, the better our design fiction will probably be. And as I told you in the last video, you can read more about it in both my book. Um, again, a little humble brag or as we would say in Danish. But you can also jump on something like Twitter or YouTube, a little on Facebook, but Twitter and YouTube, if you write design fiction there, hashtag design fiction on Twitter or just design fiction or speculative design on YouTube, you will be able to find a multitude of existing vision videos, design fictions out there to simply be inspired by what are people actually speculating about in terms of service design, in terms of digital technologies and different uh, user scenarios, etc. It is a great place to start, basically. And um, another place to go is uh, this website called ukrack.dk. It's a Danish website for another workshop that I'm hosting each year, but it's a workshop that I've been hosting in eight years now. Uh, actually more than eight years. Uh, so there are more than 600 video sketches made in a five-day sprint, just like your own here. So you can go into ukrack.dk slash concept. Many of the things in there are Danish, but many of the concept videos are English. So you can sort of begin to see what has students similar to you actually done in this time frame. So you can begin to be inspired to, okay, what techniques might I want to borrow improve upon or um, maybe not use at all uh, in the coming days. So I would clearly recommend that you jump in and check that out for tomorrow too. Okay, that was actually it. That was our two-parter here of design fiction as sort of our overall method, our overall framework of thinking in this workshop. And then... Um, this afternoon, I will post the link to the sort of quick start guide 
to Adobe Premiere and also how to set up Adobe Premiere for video sketching. And then tomorrow I'll upload the video lecture on video sketching where we will discuss a lot of the methods in detail in a slideshow. And I will also post a series of 20 minute how to videos that show how to do animation, stop motion, green screen, etc. in 